All right. One of the things that you saw, if you watched the little uh, movie, the, uh, the summary, that there are some important things that, that happen as the revolution gets going. One, Washington orders all of his men to uh, read Thomas Paine's Common Sense. Right, it was read to the troops. I told you guys that it takes us some time to make this shift from wanting to get our rights as Englishmen to breaking away and doing it ourselves, starting our own country, whatever you want to think of it. And Thomas Paine's common sense is one of those things that starts to help Americans all right, make that intellectual leap, okay? Look at the name, okay? Essentially, what Payne tells us in this pamphlet is several pamphlets that he writes, all right? Several chapters that, really, he writes, okay? Essentially, what, what he's trying to drive home is that governing ourselves is common sense. We've been doing it for a while now. We just didn't realize it, okay? Okay? that if your hang-up is uh, that we can't govern ourselves, then uh, his reply is, well, what have we been doing for uh, the past 40, 50, 60 years while the British weren't paying any attention to us? Okay. Well, we can't, you know, we don't want a monarch. Well, Thomas Paine even comes up with his own plan of government. That doesn't involve a monarch, okay? That he says, look, here we go. Here's a perfectly good plan of government that we can use ourselves, okay? So his philosophical answer to many of these things is we've already been doing it or we can do it. So don't let, don't be afraid of uh, that concept of breaking away and uh, that we can do these things if we uh, have to. So Thomas Paine's common sense was distributed uh, throughout the colonies. Okay, people read it, and I told you uh, that, I mean, think about colonial society. Okay? I mean, when, when the work is over and you go to your home, what do you do? The only thing you have to do is read. Okay? And so uh, Thomas Paine's uh, pamphlet is spread, shared, read, okay? He also makes it a good point to call out the British for uh, what we would view as, or what he certainly viewed as, tyrannical actions. Okay, they don't have the right to tax us. They don't have the right to uh, put these taxes on us unless they give us a representative. Okay? So he's laying a little bit of intellectual foundation out there for what's going to come next. Okay? Now, as... Uh, Lexington and Concord happened as the Second Continental Congress begins to meet. Washington is sent out into the field to take command of the army. Okay. It's going to be uh, that Second Continental Congress's responsibility to uh, draft this. They try one last time to appeal to the king, which fails. The king declares them all in open rebellion. And so... The Declaration of Independence is going to be the result. Now, the principal author is Thomas Jefferson. He's not alone. Okay, there are uh, there are other people on the committee, including John Adams and Ben Franklin. They make alterations to Jefferson's draft, which, by the way, Jefferson really never liked, but they do. Okay, and uh, so that drafted uh, and altered form becomes. Uh, what will become the Declaration of Independence. So, from Thomas Paine's common sense, the next real intellectual leap is this, okay? Us declaring our independence, which I told you guys is also really a declaration of war. If you go and read at the Declaration, we are for a second here, okay? If I can find it where I brought it up earlier. All right, we're going to take a look at this kind of step by step, okay? Most of you probably have never read the document, okay? 
So we are. Well, some of them. Okay. The introductory paragraph, Jefferson is setting the stage, okay? When the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. Okay? So we've reached that point where uh, we are going to dissolve this union between us and Great Britain. Okay? To assume on powers of separate equals to blah, 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 blah. Okay? A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Okay? Remember, Jefferson's a product of the Enlightenment. Okay? Logic and reason are real important to these guys. So if I'm going to tell you we're going to break away, I'm just not going to throw out this thing that says we're breaking away, na 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 okay? I'm going to tell you why we're breaking away. Okay? And he does. Okay? Here he gets a little happy plagiarizing lock. Okay? And there's a reason for that. Well, these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Locke called them uh, natural rights. Okay? And for Locke, John Locke, the political philosopher who justified uh, the glorious revolution, who justified uh, the English Bill of Rights in 1689 when William signs the English Bill of Rights and creates a constitutional monarchy in England. Locke is a big fan of constitutional government. He's a big fan of something in political science called contract theory. That government is a contract between uh, the government and uh, the governed us. Okay, and so uh, that government has responsibilities. Okay, and we have rights. And so for Jefferson, these certain unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For Locke, they were life, liberty, and property. Secure these rights, and here we go into the contract. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. There's no such thing as divine right. Government doesn't come from God. Government comes from us. We make the government. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So if your government fails you, what do you have the right to do? Alter it or abolish it. So according to uh, Jefferson, we're at this point to where the British government has failed uh, to protect our unalienable rights, okay? Then he kind of goes after the king a little bit, okay? But a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably to the same object evinces a desire to reduce them under absolute despotism. It's their right, their duty to throw off such government, provide new guards for their future security. And he says, look, this is us. King, this tyrant has been abusing us. Now it's time for us to toss them off, okay? So the history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object, the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. So now... He starts tossing out what he believes are facts. Okay? If you got you guys, how many of you taken speech? Any of you taken speech yet? Okay. When you do uh, your persuasive speech, what do you have to do? You got to persuade an audience to believe your way based on facts, right? I want you to believe that the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine is safe, okay? Here's why. We've conducted clinical trials. We have uh, seen an improvement in people that have taken blah, 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 right? You build up your case. Well, that's what Jefferson's going to do. But you got to be careful because he uses the word 
facts. Okay? Now these facts are not necessarily facts. They're certainly facts from his point of view. Okay? So, kind of keep that in mind. And you can read these. Okay, if you get into the document, you can read these. But basically, he's he is just throwing out this list of all the things that he believes a king has done wrong. Okay? Refuse to assent to laws. Forbidden the governors to pass laws. Refuse to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people. Called together legislative bodies at places unusual. Dissolved representative houses repeatedly. Okay? He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, blah, blah, blah. He's obstructed the administration of justice. He's made judges dependent on his will, multitude of new offices, kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. You kind of figured that he would uh, get to that one. Okay. Quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. Yeah, that's true, right? Cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. That's true. Okay. Depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. Yeah, that's somewhat true. Okay. Taking away our charter, suspending our own legislatures. Okay. Plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Yeah. Okay. So that may be a little bit of exaggeration and hyperbole, okay? But he's excited domestic insurrections among us, endeavor to bring our own inhabitants, our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. In other words, he's been inciting the Indians against us, okay? Okay, you get the idea. Okay, here's 27 things or so that are wrong, okay? And so when you have all of this evidence, what are we going to do? We're going to break away. Because, he says, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Of our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. So good old King George is tyrant. Okay, and uh, tyranny we will not stand, and therefore uh, we are going to uh, break away. Okay, everybody take a time out. Is Jefferson right? Is the king a tyrant? Who passed the stamp act? Huh? Who passed the Stamp Act? It's an act. Who passed it? Parliament. Who passed Towns and Duties? Parliament. Who passed the Tea Act? Parliament. Why isn't he attacking Parliament? One, the king is a much more convenient target. Okay? The king is a much more convenient target. How many of you have seen Hamilton? None of you have seen Hamilton. I should make it your responsibility to go and watch Hamilton, if nothing but for the king. Okay? How's the king portrayed in Hamilton? He's insane. And George III was bordering on insane. Okay? And he's a convenient target. Okay? So, why would you not attack Parliament? Because these guys are English citizens. And so, what kind of government are they thinking about maybe setting up if they can break away from England? A representative government, right? One like Parliament. So they're very careful, well, Jefferson is, about who he attacks here, okay? All right. You get on down to my favorite part, okay? The last paragraph. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, don't remember, they're at the Second Continental Congress, okay, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, 
solemnly publish and declare, and this is where the motion came from. This was Richard Henry Lee's motion, okay, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as a free and independent state, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other things, other, all, excuse me, all other acts and things which independent states may of right ought to do, okay? But there's the, okay? We are free, we are independent, we're going to do what the heck we want to, okay? For the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and uh, our sacred honor. And then there's the list of the people that signed it, okay? And there are some important people that do sign it, okay? If you look at the list here, Samuel Adams and John Adams are both a uh, are both signees, okay? Elbridge Jerry is a signee from Massachusetts. He will become... Uh, the first Attorney General of the United States under Washington's administration. Okay, John Penn, a descendant of uh, one of the Penns, will be a North Carolina signee. From Virginia, Richard Henry Lee, who makes the motion to uh, declare independence. Thomas Jefferson, okay. New York, okay, there are some that are there, okay, that are pretty important. Connecticut, Roger Sherman, might know who Roger Sherman is? Later, when we start talking about this new document called the Constitution, Roger Sherman will come back again, okay? And he will be an important part of uh, the uh, Constitutional Convention, okay? So, Pennsylvania, you guys know this, Benjamin Franklin is a signee, okay? And of course, from Massachusetts, the big sec the big signature you see on the Declaration, John Hancock. Okay, signs his name so big he thought that he wanted to make sure the king could see it even without his spectacles. Okay, so there are uh, the people that sign it. Okay, all right. I told you guys that this is more than just a Declaration of Independence. It is a Declaration of War. And some of the fighting has already begun. Lesson and Concord's already happened. Okay. okay, now what happens? There are two things that the colonies have got to do. Okay, well, three, really. One, they've got to govern themselves. Now that they are free and independent states, the Second Continental Congress is going to be that government and will be the government until the end of the war. Okay, until we get to the Articles of Confederation. Excuse me, the document that becomes our first real government. Two, they got to stay alive because if they lose uh, in the field, if Washington gets routed and uh, the army is destroyed, independence is over. Done. So they have to stay alive. Three, they got to get help. They are never going to survive this without help. Who is the most likely candidate to help us? who hates the British just about as much as we do, who lost all of their colonies here in North America to the British, the French. So who do we send to France right from the get-go? I know, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin is sent to France, and his job is to get help. Okay? And so uh, if you guys watched the... Uh, if you watched the, the video pretty uh, carefully last time, then you know uh, that we have to prove ourselves. The French make it pretty clear that the only way they are going to get involved in this is if we can prove that we can win. Okay? And early on, it does not go very well for us. Okay? All right. Couple of things okay, that I want you to kind of know as we kind of get into the war. Things that weren't really talked about by uh, the uh, 
by the video from last lecture for Friday's lecture. Okay. Washington is now in command of a continental army okay, that is woefully bad. One, you're only going to be able to draw support from about a third of the colonists. We know that. But one of Washington's biggest problems is that states commit their militias to the army, but only for certain times. So uh, you went out and uh, you may, uh, the New York militia may go out and say, we're going to be here for six months. Or we're going to go out and we may be here for uh, a year. And so about the time you got people that were uh, capable of fighting, they've had enough experience, they've been in the field long enough, they've sort of had adjusted to being a, a pretty good fighter, they go home because they've been away from home for a year. <coughs> the Second Continental Congress can't tax to raise money for the Continental Army. And so one of the things that happens pretty early on is we do get some supplies pretty secretly from France, but not enough to sustain us. So we need some help. And Washington has a huge headache, okay? And uh, that army is, for the most part, poorly fed, poorly equipped, poorly trained for the first part of the war. It won't be until the arrival of Baron von Steuben, okay, from Prussia, that things change. He starts to drill the American soldiers and uh, that winter in Valley Forge, and they turn into uh, a uh, capable fighting force. So... But early on, Washington is in trouble. So this first part of the war, you see Washington pretty much get chased around. And he has to stay alive. Now, a strategy of retreat is never going to win you any uh, all right, wars, right? But Washington knows he has to stay alive. And every time that he is outnumbered, he will try to put a body of water between him and the British, or he will try to retreat to an area that the British won't pursue him. Okay. When you look at the military strategies, now, here's a uh, kind of a military topic, okay, that military historians, trained military historians like me, we always talk about. Strategy is grand. Okay, strategy is how do we win the war. Tactics are what you do on the battlefield to try to uh, win the war, okay, or win the battle. So strategy is big, okay. The British, this is one of the problems they have. They flood this, okay. What is uh, their strategy, okay? How do we win this war? Now that they've declared independence, how do we put these colonies back in their place? The answer, I don't really know. Okay. What is our strategy? Ours is simple. Hold on and get help. Okay. So we want to delay as long as possible. We'll attack the British supply lines. We will try to fight a war of attrition. We'll try to drag it out. Okay, we'll use guerrilla tactics. Essentially, we fight an insurgency. A friend who teaches in uh, a uh, college in Georgia, we were actually talking about this the other day because he asked me what I was teaching about, and I told him we were Zooming with some of our other friends, and uh, he said, what are you talking about right now? And I said, the, the revolution. And he said, oh, you mean the insurgency? In his opinion, really, the American Revolution begins as an insurgency, then evolves into a war for independence, and then a revolution. So one of the things that we do is fight a guerrilla war, okay, and learn how to spell guerrilla, okay, in military terms, uh, all right, guerrilla is spelled like this is a Spanish word, all right, guerrilla, which means little war, okay, gorillas, 
G-O-R-I-L-L-A, do what? They live in the jungle, right? You're not fighting a gorilla war, you're fighting a gorilla war, okay? What's a gorilla war? The Vietnamese do this really well during the Vietnam War to us. Okay, what do you do? You don't fight all out, okay? You fight small tactics, you attack supply lines, you attack officers or bases, and then uh, you disappear back into uh, the uh, your, your villages, okay? It's a partisan war, okay? You're a farmer by day, you're a soldier by night. We try to wear the British down, okay? And of course, I told you we've got to make an alliance, okay? we got to get help. The British, <coughs> they struggle with this. <coughs> One of the only things they do somewhat successfully is cut off our trade from the rest of the world. They do accomplish that. But they felt like the best strategy was to break the colonies up and then take them out one by one. Okay? Kind of a divide and conquer strategy. Okay? Break the colonies up. And then uh, divide them up. And remember, a third of the American colonies are on whose side? The British, okay? So they want to use those loyalists to uh, help them uh, gain control of areas, especially in the South, where there was a higher concentration of loyalists. All right. Some of these were talked about, and some of these strategies were talked about in that film, okay? The Northern Campaign, uh, all right, you see that... Really, one of the things that the British are going to try to do is uh, to keep us in check. One of the first things we try to do is go and take Quebec and Montreal, okay, which we always do, and we fail. Okay. Now, in June of 1775, you have one of the first major battles early in the war, Bunker Hill. It's actually Breed's Hill, but who cares, okay? Bunker Hill, uh, the British are trying to, really, the British are sort of uh, surrounded. They're sort of uh, besieged in Boston. They try to break the siege by attacking the American position at Bunker Hill. And it's a disaster. The British will uh, charge into the American, uh, really, emplacements, and the British get clobbered, okay? So much so they have to abandon Boston, okay? Woohoo! Huge victory for us, right? No. Okay, they pull back and then they invade New York, okay? And uh, that will become really a major base of operation. The most important, really, the most important campaign for the British happens very early in the war. It's one that's talked about in the film. If you didn't catch this, you need to kind of go back and uh, look at it, okay? Now, on the map, this looks all crazy, okay? But let me see if I can get the little thing here to come up. Oh, well, poop. All right, well, here we go. I'll just do it this way, okay? If you look on the map, the British launch this three-pronged plan to cut off Massachusetts from the rest of the colonies. One army was here in New York, okay, under the command of uh, General Howe, okay? You see him right down here, okay? So Howe is here in New York. Up here in Montreal is Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, okay? So Burgoyne is supposed to push down through Lake Champlain, headed this way, okay? The other... British General St. Leger, and he's supposed to come in off Lake Ontario, pick up the Mohawk River, and push there his way towards Albany. And uh, Howe, down here from New York, was supposed to push up the Hudson River towards Albany. And essentially, you're going to have three British armies come together near Albany, and that would have cut off Massachusetts from the rest of the colony. Does that make sense? So you've got one coming here, you got one army pushing this way, you got one army pushing this way, and you're supposed to have another army pushing this way. And if they link up, 
Massachusetts is cut off. Okay, actually, most of New England is cut off. Plans are great. Okay. Closets, a great military historian, said that plans rarely survive first contact with the enemy, though. Okay. Having a plan is great. Executing it a little bit different. How totally ignores the plan and instead of pushing up the Hudson River goes and takes Philadelphia. Which is great except he's not where he's supposed to be. So one third of the British force that's supposed to link up in Albany is a no-show because Howe is uh, remarkably stupid and goes and takes Philadelphia rather than doing what he's supposed to. <clears throat> St. Leger is stopped in his tracks by an American force right at the beginning of the Mohawk River at Oriskany in August of 1777, and he can make no further progress. So St. Leger's force is delayed and has not been able to push past Oriskany. The only body that is close to where he's supposed to be is gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. Burgoyne is a British commander, all right, a dandy. He has this huge supply line with him, and essentially he's cutting a path through uh, northern New York, past Fort Ticonderoga, and then down past Lake Champlain to pick up the Hudson, and he is supposed to be heading towards Albany. Burgoyne is the only one that gets anywhere close to where he's supposed to be. But he's only one-third of the British force. And so uh, the Americans are there waiting. And under Horatio Gates, the American force ambushes Burgoyne at Saratoga. Burgoyne has very little choice. He's ambushed. He uh, is in a very dire situation. And he surrenders. Saratoga is the turning point of the war. Okay? Saratoga, all military historians will tell you that Saratoga is the turning point of the war. Why? One, we prove that we can win a major set-piece battle. A European-style battle. Okay? Which is what the French, what the, the French were waiting on. So after Saratoga in October of 1777, who now uh, begins to help us? The French. We sign an alliance with the French. They start sending us weapons, uh, more weapons. They start sending us supplies. Some major French will, uh, soldiers even, will come and volunteer, including Lafayette. And the French Navy starts to help us. Remember the blockade? So who's going to help us deal with uh, the English blockade? The French Navy. This is a major uh, turning point. Okay, this is a uh, this is a big deal. Okay, Saratoga is huge, and it happens early in the war. Declaration of Independence, July of 1776. A little over a year later, you've got the turning point. Now, don't think that we're doing great, okay, because New York is attacked, New York is burning, okay, we get routed in New York, we get pushed out of New York, okay. Washington will have to uh, put some bodies of water between him and other places, okay, including uh, he's trying to fight and he will attack a British force at, in New Jersey, and that's Washington's famous crossing of the Delaware. So don't think everything's going great because it's not, okay? But after the disaster at Saratoga, the British changed strategies, and they will pull south. So now their decision in the south is to try to break the southern colonies away, use the loyalists there to help them, and then they'll push back north, okay? Southern strategy 
depended on taking uh, Savannah and Charleston, which the British do. And then uh, a uh, British general named Cornwallis will push into South Carolina and then towards North Carolina and then eventually towards Virginia. After several major victories, Cornwallis runs into trouble as he gets into the border between North Carolina and South Carolina. He'll be defeated by uh, the American forces at Calpins and uh, at <coughs> later on that year in Kings Mountain. Cornwallis turns and heads back to Virginia where he realizes he needs to resupply and he makes a terrible mis mistake. He pulls his army out onto the Yorktown Peninsula in Virginia where he gets isolated. The French rush in, Washington rushes in, uh, Cornwallis gets surrounded on uh, the Yorktown Peninsula here, okay, and he ends up surrendering. Yorktown happens in 1781, in October of 1781. By the next year, the British are done. They, they, after Yorktown, the British decide to stop prosecuting the war, and negotiations start to take place, okay? So after Cornwallis surrenders at Yorktown, essentially the war is over, okay? Why did the British lose? Great question, okay? Don't think, by the way, that we score some major victory. We do, but the British do a lousy job of fighting this war. The British underestimated us from the beginning, and that cost them dearly. They questioned our commitment. They questioned our resolve. They did not take into account all of their deficiencies, long supply lines, okay, fighting uh, on someone else's home soil, okay, the, uh, the ability or the, uh, really, the, uh, the effectiveness of an insurgency or guerrilla warfare, okay, all of that stuff comes back to haunt them. But the British do not prosecute this war like they should have, and they pay for it, okay? They don't commit enough troops, they don't commit, and remember, Economically, it's very difficult for them to fight this war because they were broke coming out of the French and Indian War. So they decide to cut their losses, and they will uh, work out an agreement between themselves and the American colonists. And so uh, North America in 1783, at the Peace of Paris of 1783, changes. This is the map. Everything that you see in brown up there, okay, becomes uh, American territory. We get very generous boundaries from the British. Essentially, the 13 colonies and everything westward to the Mississippi River. From the Great Lakes south, okay, to the border of Spanish Florida. Okay. So the Spanish get Florida, the Spanish get this, everything west of the Mississippi is Spanish, okay? This area that you see in Mississippi and Alabama today <coughs> is disputed. The Americans actually think it's theirs, the Spanish think it's theirs, okay? So there's some dispute there, okay? But that will eventually be resolved as we'll find out later on. So all of this, okay, from the Atlantic, from the Mississippi, south from the Great Lakes, all of that becomes American territory. We get very generous boundaries. Good for us. There are some problems. The British promise that they are going to abandon some of these forts out west. In the Great Lakes region and other places that they had taken control of from the French. They will be very reluctant to do so, okay? They also promise they won't incite the Indians against us, which they do, okay? Now, we screw up too. We promise to uh, pay back damages to loyalists 
who had their property or had their uh, homes or their property seized and destroyed, that they would be compensated. We won't. <laughs> so uh, we're just as guilty of not abiding by all the terms of the Treaty of Paris as they are. Okay. But, okay, what this leads us to is this. Okay, what we're going to talk about on Wednesday, since you guys won't be here, is uh, our first governments. Okay, we're going to talk about the Articles of Confederation, which essentially takes us from 1781 to 1789. Okay, now I can sum up the articles in a word for you guys. Okay, disaster. Okay, they're terrible. But there's a reason why they're terrible. It's fear. Okay. The American colonists are going to craft a government that's very weak because their belief was if they gave too much power to government, it would end up being tyrannical like the British had become. So they don't want an executive, for example, because they're afraid that an executive would become a king. Okay? So they're very, they create a very weak government that's going to prove disastrous. Okay? which is why we have to change it in 1789 to what? A constitution. So on Wednesday, we're going to kind of run through these things for you guys that aren't here. And on Friday, okay, Friday will be a big day. Okay, our lecture on Friday will be the Washington administration. Okay, the first presidential administration. So on Friday, I'm going to take you guys through, uh, all right, the, uh, through the Washington administration. Okay. So that'll be our first real presidential administration, okay? So uh, be looking for that, okay? All right, see you guys. <coughs> Stay safe.